Welcome back and thank you for joining us this evening for this regional spotlight on realizing the disruptive potential of research-led innovation in India's agri-food ecosystem. For almost a decade, innovation in India's agri-food ecosystem has been largely dominated by digital solutions that work to build in efficiency, automate and add value across India's agri-food value chains. And while these innovations are incredibly valuable, today's speakers are keen to look beyond this to the next frontier and to realize the untapped potential of research-led agri-food innovation in India, such as the role of biotechnology. We are thrilled about the significant knowledge and experience that each of our panelists will bring to this discussion today. First, we welcome Ramana Huja, co-founder of ThinkAg, a not-for-profit organization whose vision is to support agri-food innovators to scale rapidly by building India's largest agri-stakeholder network, nurturing partnerships, and creating knowledge that will accelerate investments in the sector. Next, we welcome Anuj Maheshwari, Managing Director of Agri-Food Investment at Tamasak, to share a global perspective on research-led innovation in agri-food. Tamasak, for those of you who don't know, is a global investment company headquartered in Singapore with a global portfolio that spans a broad spectrum of industries, financial services, telecommunications, media and technology, consumer and real estate, transportation and industrials, as well as life sciences and agri-food. Their, investment, their investments have also targeted multiple biotechnology companies over the years. And then, to discuss how we can better support research-backed enterprises that will disrupt India's agri-food system, we will welcome an esteemed panel of experts. Kirsten Stead, who is the Managing Director of DCVC Bio, a US-based venture capital firm that actively backs entrepreneurs using deep tech. Sunil Sukumaran, who is the CTO of Perfect Day, a food technology company developing biosynthetic dairy alternative proteins. Pupin Dubey, who is the global CEO of Advanta Seeds, a UPL group company, which prides itself on decades of R&D in the most advanced technologies in plant genetics. Renu Swarup, the former secretary to the Government of India, Department of Biotechnology, and former chairperson of the Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council. And moderating this panel discussion, we have Ritu Verma, the co-founder of ThinkArc and managing partner of Ankur Capital. So without further ado, I present to you our first speaker. Ramana Huja from ThinkAg. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining this India Spotlight panel discussion at the Asia Pacific Agri Food Innovation Summit hosted by Rethink in partnership with Temasek. The session will focus on the need and potential of research led innovations in India's agri food ecosystem. My name is Raman Ahuja and I'm a co-founder of ThinkAg, a not-for-profit platform established to accelerate investments and adoption of innovation in food and agri-value chains. To kick off this session, I will be presenting the highlights of ThinkAg's AgTech Investment Landscape Report 2021, which will provide some context on India's rapidly evolving agri-tech subsector, an important part of the overall agri-food tech ecosystem. Before I begin, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank our partners in this publication's journey, Rabo Foundation, Bayer Crop Science, and ADB Ventures. Investments in India Ag Tech slowed down in 2020, attributable to some extent to a pause in deal making activity during the ongoing pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated adoption of digital tools across sectors and income strata and will likely positively impact the fortunes of ag tech companies in the coming years. This has already borne out with investments in 2021 already approaching the half a billion dollar mark. This is despite the absence of investments in consumer facing companies like Big Basket, which got acquired earlier this year and had been the highest fundraiser in the sector in the previous years. Last year, ThinkAg had predicted growing investments in downstream ag tech and ag fintech. 
While the former has grown in prominence during the pandemic, ag fintech has seen fewer new entrants and low investments in the year gone by. While the need for ag fintech solutions remains significant, it is increasingly being serviced by existing ag tech companies by adding an interface layer to their core operations. The ag tech categories identify the core areas of operation for Indian ag techs. Many players are now blurring these lines by dabbling across multiple parts of the value chain. This is an evolving space as service and delivery become increasingly differentiated we may see new categories emerging or the boundaries sharpening. A few ag tech sectors remain notably absent from the investment and innovation landscape. Ag biotech, including biotechnology and biomaterials used as agri inputs in processing and for shelf life extension. And ag automation, which includes farm mechanization, has seen surprisingly little investment activity. Looking specifically at the up and coming ag tech sectors in this, <coughs> it is interesting to note that the subsector breakdown of the first time fundraisers is fairly similar to that observed, that observed in follow on rounds. With the notable exception of ag input supply chain category, they saw a higher proportion of first time deals, indicating increased experimentation with novel farm proximate models. Various indicators point to increased traction of ag tech models. Though investments fell overall, investments in higher end funding brackets, which is about 5 million, grew in the year gone by, shifting the median investment up by 50% over the previous year. Ag techs have raised, that raised the largest 10 deals took an average 2.8 years since their first million, compared to four years in the corresponding group in the previous year suggesting that some models are able to scale or grow at a faster pace than in the past and therefore access larger caches of capital. As a broader base of entrepreneurs enter the space, we are likely to see more solutions and business models that will get tested in the value chains. Sector agnostic investors are rapidly growing their participation in Indian ag tech. Almost all the new sources of venture capital in the sector have been generalist funds. This signifies growing awareness of the sector's potential and a more informed ability to assess business models and the role of technology in agri value chains. New investors are entering to provide late stage growth capital, signifying greater investor confidence in the sector. Such investors with previous exposure to ag tech investments in other geographies could become crucial players in the Indian ag tech space. However, corporate venture capital flows from traditional Indian agribusinesses continue to remain sparse and are limited to late stage investments and downstream ag tech solutions. The inefficiencies in India's highly intermediate supply chains create fertile ground for tech enabled solutions. Digital interventions should enable operators and the ecosystem to be more efficient rather than merely adding a digital layer over an existing physical supply chain. That said, given the need for localized high touch approach, it remains to be seen if digital based in disintermediation will be indeed viable. The fragmented nature of agriculture supply chains is encouraging the more mature ag tech startups to develop a platform approach by offering a bouquet of services to sector stakeholders including farmers as well as input and output agribusinesses. These solutions aim to benefit from accruing higher revenues per user. B2B SaaS models are more often seen with point solutions in precision ag tech category. Their plug and play nature enables them to scale effectively through partnerships with other ag techs as well as with other markets globally. However, they run the risk of having finite markets and sources of value to scale. The freemium model, relatively nascent in Indian ag tech, is one where startups provide a non-monetized offering to attract customers and then generate revenue through the supplementation of additional useful services. Ag tech startups catering to farmers face a high threshold 
in terms of being paid for services and linking them to enhanced incomes. High cost of accessing and onboarding individual smallholder farmers that dominate the Indian ag supply chain, coupled with the smallholders' low risk tolerance, poses an uphill battle for ag tech startups to connect with smallholders. Ag tech startups identify a strong need for a physical on-ground presence to build trust and augment adoption among farmers, especially smallholders. Leveraging a next to last mile approach through, through aggregation platforms like farmer producer organizations could lower the cost for ag techs to reach smallholder farmers. Partnership with local businesses, both agri and allied services that serve, a free, that serve as frequent touch points to reach smallholder farmers could also be leveraged. Our study identified three dimensions that hold the promise for scaling. Public sector program targeted at farmers should actively invite ag techs to offer services across the value chain. Engagement with traditional input and output corporates can be mutually beneficial for ag techs looking to scale. Their vast networks of farmers and established financial and operational channels provide low cost access to scale. For corporates and agribusinesses, this presents an opportunity to enhance their service offerings to farmers via digital channels and also gain access to novel innovations. Currently, such engagements are limited in number and focus entirely on digital solutions in the ag tech ecosystem. A data pipeline from ag tech to fintech players could go a long way towards augmenting the ag tech startups. Indian ag tech solutions are largely dominated by application of digital technologies to upstream and downstream supply chains. The use of fourth IR tools in Indian agriculture is growing, but remains at early stages. Another area with nascent innovation in India is in standalone agro logistics. In our report, we do a case study of Pendodu, China, whose highly successful model is hinged on leveraging existing logistic players in the ecosystem. Such low cost and high connectivity logistics are still an underexplored area of Indian ag tech innovation. Research led innovations are the key to building a sustainable agri food system. Promising areas of deep tech research already gaining importance in developed markets include gene editing, novel farming techniques, metabolic engineering, synthetic biotechnology, bioagri inputs and biomaterials for food shelf life extension. Developed in conjunction with traditional knowledge systems, such innovations hold the key to creating a future ready food system. There are, however, barriers in the ecosystem that have prevented this from happening thus far. Deficit in infrastructure, absence of a developed culture of commercializing research and lack of appropriate incentives to focus on innovations that require upfront capital commitments. Building on the service provision capabilities currently being developed in India's agri ecosystem, there is a need for product innovation with both local and global applicability. For the sector to see development of novel products, processes and techniques, support for agri food specific research and innovation ecosystem will need to be bolstered. Initiatives that encourage entrepreneurship among domain experts and robust incubation assistance will be crucial towards this. With the pandemic induced crisis stretching on, the need for robust, efficient, transparent, traceable supply is all the more pressing. Supply chain innovations are therefore likely to continue in their dominance in the Indian ag tech space. Opportunities to build efficiency across fishery, aquaculture, poultry are both ample and attractive and we'll see a lot of activity in the coming years. Partnerships show a promise, and this includes partnerships between the Actex as well as joint ventures with global companies, collaborations across agribusinesses and financial services organizations, and importantly, the public sector. All these will be necessary 
conditions for growth in adoption. Agtex have the potential to create value in Indian agriculture and food. However, there are numerous barriers, informational, logistical, and financial, that impede its benefit to smallholder farmers. Public good investments by governments and development organizations would be crucial to overcoming this. And finally, the imperative to have a sustainable food system calls on us to adopt an agri-food tech lens, which views the innovation surrounding cultivation and consumption on the same continuum. This approach also emphasizes the need to invest in agri-food specific research-led product and process innovation that will define the future of India's agri-food ecosystem. At ThinkAg, we will continue to work with all stakeholders to share our inputs as this framework is developed further. Thank you very much for your patience. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anuj Maheshwari, and I am a managing director at Thamasek. As many of you know, Thamasek is a global investment firm headquartered in Singapore. I founded Thamasek's agri-food team in 2013 as we saw a glaring gap. The way we saw food being produced and consumed has been unchanged for decades, and the technology revolution has largely skipped the sector. We saw the need to reimagine the food system driven by three needs, reducing waste, eliminating hunger, and decreasing the environmental impact of food. Little did I know that we were on the heels of a massive upheaval in the sector. Last year alone, US dollar $20 billion billion was invested across the agri-food tech sector. And this year already looks like we might be crossing 30 billion US dollars. Over the last eight years, Themasek has invested over US dollar 8 billion in this sector uh, from farm to fork value chain. Among this are 30 startups and these companies are around the world and several of them have become unicorns. Over the next few slides, I will talk about our global investment thesis in the sector and three exciting areas of research-led innovation. I also want to highlight in this presentation that AgTech is much more than digital solutions, which obviously have proliferated immensely in India. So first with the, with the global thesis, global food demand is growing at anywhere between three and 4% every year. This is driven by the need for more food as the population grows from 7.8 billion to 10 billion, we'll need 50% more, more, more energy, 40% more food, and 10% more water. There's also a demand for better fruit from consumers around the world. With climate change, resources are, are shrinking. Rising temperatures are felt all around the world, and so are increasing weather effects. We also have seen decrease in water availability across many continents and increasing pest pressure. There is therefore an urgent need to reimagine the food system. And there are so many technologies that can help us do that. So who is going to do this innovation? The, this innovation in research, that is the need of the hour. Historically, there has been very limited investment in agri-food innovation. A study done by PwC jointly with Temasek, which surveys, surveyed over 1,000 companies around the world, re, ex, exposed that the agri-food sector probably has the least amount of R&D spend across all industries. And therefore, we have seen a, a huge proliferation of agri-food startups, which have filled the innovation gap. As I mentioned, the investment figures have already crossed 20 billion, and we expect that to grow significantly more. In the next few slides, I will now talk about three areas where we see immense research-led innovation happening in the years going forward. The first area is that of non-animal-based foods. I believe that we are at the cusp of a major disruption in the food and agriculture production since the first domestication of plants and animals 10,000 years ago. This is primarily a protein disruption and protein demand is growing significantly thanks to increasing population and health conscious eating 
where people are shunning carbohydrates and fats over proteins. Today, there are several technologies which are available to produce proteins, and these are at different levels of maturity. It's well known that plant-based foods are proliferating, replicating the text, texture, and the nutritional properties of meats and dairies around the world. Already, certain plant-based foods like dairy are as much as 15% of the overall market in the United States. Microorganism-based foods use algae, bacteria, or fungi and are able to produce proteins which are very similar um, to that of the plant-based sources. We've also seen insect-based proteins come up, especially with, with black soldier flies, which are very efficient sources of protein. But what is very interesting is cultured meat, where animal tissues can be replicated in a bioreactor to produce animal meat without killing the animal. I will zoom into cultural meat because it offers massive research-led opportunities. So what is cultured meat and how is it produced? In this complex diagram, you'll see uh, primary or stem cells are extracted from an animal without killing it. Cells are then fed with a media, usually containing growth factors, amino acids, and so on and so forth in a bioreactor to proliferate. These cells differentiate in a perfusion bioreactor with new media and scaffolding materials. Then standardized procedures such as formulation, downstream processing uh, it, it takes place, which allows the product to look like meat. The current si situation in the sector is most of this media requires what is called the fetal bovine serum or FBS, uh, and it uses pharma grade components to produce uh, uh, animal meat. Cost of FBS free media needs to reduce significantly in order for cell based meat to be commercially viable. So the requirements for commercialization of cell based meats is essentially FBS free growth media, which can be available at, at low cost, um, being able to develop products at consistent quality and availability, which is, uh, which is good enough for food supply and, and producing growth factors, uh, which are significantly um you know have a longer shelf life all these innovations are the need of the hour and they offer very exciting opportunities in innovation and research and many startups especially in israel in singapore and in the united states uh, as well as netherlands are already um, are doing this so this is the first area that i wanted to highlight the second most interesting space is that of synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is a discipline in which ma the main objective is to create fully operational existing and novel biological systems from smaller constituent plants, usually DNAs, protein, and so on and so forth. This encompasses biotechnologies necessary to design cell cells and microorganisms using en genetic engineering, systems biology, computational biology. Um, this uh, area has, has conceptually shifted from being a research area to being an engineering area, just like software. Today, synthetic biologists can engineer biology and, and produce things of quality, nutrition, taste, and, and structure. This technology um, can be used to produce a variety of compounds from proteins to industrial chemicals. And, and what's most important is that what has unleashed the potential of synthetic biologies is two changes. Firstly, the rapid decline in the cost of underlying technology, the cost of fully sequencing a human genome, as we all know, uh, know has come down multifold. It used to be a billion dollars in the year 2000. Uh, today, it's less than a thousand dollars. And that, that holds true for, for genomics applied to animals and plants as well. And similarly, the cost of computing has cost, uh, gone down. So this enables the generation and, and the use of data for synthetic biology, which allows us to to create organisms which can, which can have a desired effect. The second innovation which has unleashed the potential of synthetic biology is high throughput screening. This is essentially an experimentation process relevant to the fields of chemistry and biology in which hundreds and thousands of samples are subject to simultaneous tense testing. Enabled by robotics, sensors, automation, high throughput screening can quickly generate large data sets that can, you, that can be helpful in, in figuring out complex biological questions. 
I'll give you two examples of companies which have done and created massive value in this sector. The first one is a company called Ambris. It's a leading synthetic biology platform uh, with clean chemistry from sustainable sources. Its proprietary lab to market operating system optimizes learning cycles and accelerates the time to, to market. As you can see on the right side, uh, the time to market has significantly uh, decreased in Ambris. Today, Ambris is listed with an over billion dollar, sorry, it's not a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar market cap uh, in the United States. The second company is Pivot Bio. Founded in 2011, Pivot Bio has patented remodeling technology to engineer microbes to take nitrogen from the air and make it available to crops. Uh, this company's products are available for US farmers and its products have grown multifold over the last, last year and over a million acres are using the microbes produced by Pivot Bio uh, and replacing the use of synthetic fertilizers. My final area of discussion is, the, is robotics and automation in agri-food. Why agriculture robotics? The current agriculture system faces unprecedented challenges, especially of acute labor challenges. Um, and therefore, many farms are in a need of innovation. This space is still early, but there are very interesting companies which are coming up, which are adopting new technologies. Essentially, um, if I just move to the next slide, um, uh, automation and uh, robotics can apply be applied across the agricultural value chain, whether it's a plant and weeding, whether it's agrochemicals, irrigation, harvesting and packing, or even in primary processing. In fact, outside of crop uh, agriculture, it can also be applied to livestock management, uh, especially dairy management for milking rob robots, uh, dairy data analytics, uh, as well as animal management, such as herding, um, feeding, grooming, and, and so on and so forth. And these applications can be both for large scale farms, but also for smallholder farms. Uh, for example, what we're seeing in China is massive proliferation of agricultural drones, which are now being used by smallholders to do spraying, but also to make uh, efficient decisions when it comes to crops. So um, I, I have one example of a very successful company uh, in this space, uh, a company called Blue River, which was one of the initial success stories in the agri-robotics sector. This company was, was acquired by John Deere for over $300 million in 2017 and 18. Um, this company was, is a California-based company. Its system used AI and machine learning to enable decision-making at a plant level. Um, it's essentially a see and spray technology uh, allowed uh, for precision spraying of individual plants and apply herbicides only where needed, which exactly is what, what is needed in agriculture system. It also innovated a, a product which was farm as a service um, and provided an end-to-end -end service to its, uh, uh, to its customers, which are essentially the farmers, and charged, charged based on service on a per acre or a per hour ba uh, basis. Um, it therefore removed the, essentially the friction and the upfront investment required uh, in, in, uh, in buying this technology. So essentially you, instead of selling equipment, the company sold a service to its farmers. And so these kinds of models in agricultural um, uh, automation and robotics can be essentially a way forward in creating new, new kind of products. Um, so as you saw, I, I talked about three areas. Of course, there are many, many areas of global research and innovation. Um, um, this is my final slide. Um, I believe uh, it, for, from an India context, uh, we are in a golden era for entrepreneurship in the agri-food sector. Uh, sorry, yes, uh, this is final slide. We are in the golden era for entrepreneurship in the agri-food sector. Um, there are many unsolved challenges in the sector that require urgent attention. Um, companies and founders should consider different technologies, uh, not just only digital platforms. For example, synthetic biology, robotics, precision fermentation to develop new products and services. Uh, and it's my belief that India's agri-food tech has a long way to go with many unicorns yet to come over the years. So with that, um, uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, and I hope you found it useful.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are tuning in. Um, I'm super, super excited to be running this panel. And uh, we have some really amazing people here to sort of talk about insights and talk about landscapes for actually building deep science-led ag and food uh, companies. Um, I think you guys have been listening to Raman and Anuj and uh, from uh, you know listening about sort of the resource constraints, the increases in demand, the impact of climate change, and also some of the exciting uh, innovations that are coming out in the agri-food innovation system globally over here. But I think you probably also heard that uh, in the Indian context, there hasn't actually been that many companies or startups that have kind of uh, developed as of yet. So it's, a, it's at a much, much earlier scale. So what we're here to do is sort of talk a little bit about this global landscape, talk about some of the trends from people who are actual experts and have seats inside or right next to some of the uh, you know, changes that are happening globally and in India, and sort of unpack what are the opportunities uh, coming out of India that can actually uh, you know, address some of the issues that everybody is facing globally. I am not going to take the time to introduce everybody because I want to have a chat and I want you guys to sort of have a chat with everybody here. So please feel free to pop in questions because I can't think of a better set of people to ask about building or investing in some of these enterprises than the folks that we have on the panel over here. But I'm going to assume you all guys have read everybody's bio and deep dive right in and let your questions and let them talk about some of their experiences that are extremely valuable for anyone embarking in this ecosystem today. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Swarup, I am going to start with you. Um, you know, you have been the architect for creating the infrastructure for many of these uh, deep science led innovations and startups in the Indian context. Um, you know, we just heard about uh, lots of trends that are afoot globally and which are true in India as well. What I would love to get from you is, uh, do you, you know, what, what kind of things do you see coming through in the Indian ecosystem? You know, you've seen more than 5,000 startups. You know, I know some of those are in healthcare, but I know that agri and food has also been part of what you've seen coming through the ecosystem. So I'd love for you to give us a little bit of an introductory overview of the ecosystem, what you sort of see as the opportunities and what you know you are seeing being built in India on the ground up. Thank you very much, Ritu, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's, it's a pleasure to be here for this very important session that you have. And uh, as you've said, the spotlight on India. Uh, but Rightly, I think it's important for us to see what really is the global ecosystem today and where India positions itself within that larger global ecosystem. So we have seen really a revolution, if you may call it, in terms of what the startup ecosystem has been over the last couple of years. We've seen the growth of the startups. We've seen the innovation tech-led startups moving forward. We've seen and not just uh, the breaking of silos between academia, industry, and the startups, but we've also seen much more confidence now coming in between the, the researchers, the startups, and more importantly for a panel such as this, the investors. There is now more of a risk-taking ability. There is more risk mitigation coming in from the government. And whatever we've done in these last many years, I think clearly, this pandemic, when it came to us, which came to us obviously as uh, something which none of us expected, in the area of healthcare, this was like a test bed where we put to, you know, immediate, uh, we, we brought out to the ground all the various models that we had put out for ourselves. And if you saw that these response that we had of SNT and technology to fight the COVID. It was because we had this robust ecosystem in play. It's also given us a level of confidence that our startups can come forward and deliver to challenges such as this, which are not just nation specific, but they're global. And if this can happen in the healthcare sector, there is all confidence we have that this is also where we are ready for the agri sector. 
in india if you look at it our journey in the last couple of years has been very interesting and over the last decade india has built up a very robust ecosystem uh, for startups for innovation which i just mentioned and yes you are right ritu we have nearly 50% of them in the healthcare sector but there is a substantial number nearly about 25 to 30% which are in the agri sector it's important to see what is it that we are looking at from the agri sector it's not just um technologies that would only look at uh, ai or which would look at uh, improvements and innovations in terms of delivery systems or innovations in terms of how do you help uh, you know the farmers at in looking at their farm machineries but it's also looking at some of the key technologies the disruptive technologies which are coming forward whether it's looking at the omics revolution that you have and looking at um using that for market assisted selections and we are now trying to bring in a lot of industry based revolution working along with our, our researchers on that but it's also important to see that in addition to this what we've done in india is we've actually taken science to the farmers we've actually connected the farmers with the science where we've had what we call a uh, sort of immersion programs where young innovators young researchers are connected with these um, what we have krishi vigyan kendras or these are those extension workers and identify what their problems are and take those solutions to them and that's how we built these agri incubators we have in fact today more than 10 such agri incubators which we are now moving to tech clusters so i think what i would just like to emphasize here is when we talk about innovation models it's not just about innovation in technology it's innovation in operation models it's innovation in the partnership models and it's also innovation in the investment model how are you going to invest forward is it just the startups that you're looking at or is it this whole consortia or cluster approach that we bring forward where you have the academia the researcher technology moving in because that's where the confidence of investment comes in to investors because you have a lot of tech based um risk mitigation which gets done when the government comes ahead and that's what we've done in india so we've set up this model we've set up this pilot and i think what is now important is we we've created a model which is scalable and you rightly said we started from less than 500 startups and today we are at about 5000 startups we've been able to build these huge models but now what's important and that's where all of you play a very important role is we can scale it up but how are you going to sustain it where is the sustainability model once we've scaled it up and i think that comes in when there is a complete participation of all stakeholders including investors you need to look at innovative models to do that whether it's in the technology whether it's in the infrastructure whether it's in new models whether you're talking about self help groups you're talking about crop diversification models or any of them or nutraceuticals or new disruptive technologies like protein based fermentation etc i think that's really the way forward and i'm sure many of the panelists will speak about it but that's really where we are positioned today so i'll stop here ritu and uh, wait to hear from the other panelists Definitely, Dr. Swaroop. I think we will definitely hear from the other panels and sort of what I heard you say that it is in early days and there are other parts of the ecosystem that have to come together. And you know, you guys have done an amazing job of actually supporting and de-risking some of the science. But but other actors also have to kind of step up and sort of join the fray here. Um, just, Dr. Swaroop, I'm going to stay on you for a couple of more minutes. I would just love to also just hear from all of these startups that you've been working in the agri and food space. Um, you know, is there? Uh, a, do they? Uh, and you know, I know there's a lot of digital startups in India, right? So let's let's not go there. I think that's there, there's a lot of that. But here on the deep science based startups, you know, you. alluded to some fermentation based stuff you alluded to uh, you know some omics technologies etc you know is there is there trends that you are you're seeing from the science side that is driving innovators in the india space in you know your your the early signal person here so is there something that you're seeing here that are uh, you know uh, that either for india or for the globe that uh, we should be aware of as we get deeper into these discussions so ritu there are two models that we'll need to look at and one is clearly those large urban based commercial 
agri models which would be the commercial based you know where there's a complete um, market demand and then there's a push and pull mm. factor and the second factor that we look at which is again showing us early trends is how do we take technologies to our rural sector which becomes more societal based which are more mm. um, social innovation based so we are focusing on both those models which are not as you rightly said not just based on ai and machine learning and iot but they are more technology based that's where when you look at the commercial models yes technologies such as the omics revolution that we have today has clearly brought in um, something which is and there i think what i would like to emphasize is that the de-risking is clearly in terms of connecting the startups to the research institute and that's where yeah. our cluster of comes forward because we it's not possible any longer to have researchers develop technologies and then create technology transfer offices where you actually transfer that technology a startup takes it and takes it forward that model may not work it clearly has to be a co development model where you have the researcher the startup and definitely the large industry to be partners to it we've created these cluster models and you know we have excellent bioscience clusters which exist uh, we have in fact currently about four or five in the department of biotechnology and birac have been tearing this uh, we are now looking at what we call the urjit clusters the university coming in the university research institute joint translational clusters that is really where we are looking at that head and many of these which are now located in our incubation centers so what makes it possible then is all the learnings that you have all the knowledge creation which gets done rightly so in the research institutes gets then translated hmm. and then it Sorry. becomes a business model which initially through the startups you can see it you know in different um, levels of the translation but eventually i think once it needs to be scaled up you will have to have the large industries which will come in uh, we have many other new technologies coming in like speed breeding etc so those are excellent models which we are seeing you know interest uh, technologies which have again a lot of potential and we've seen many of our startups not just scaling within the country but growing across the borders is technologies such as pheromones and many others such you look at the soil and pest management technologies so those again are key technologies which have had huge focus uh, for the social innovation aspect i spoke about the uh, immersion programs that we have with farmers so we've created these kisan hubs as we call them and here we are looking at models that we've taken in terms of nutrition rich foods which so actually also helping many of these startups to create small enterprises which allow the uh, you know taking technology in terms of what which are the nutrition rich uh, food technologies whether it's uh, the crop diversification or it's looking at uh, new models of nutraceuticals etc taking it right from the farm to the product so linking these farms with many of these food parks and these food incubators to take the technology and convert it into a product one such is we've actually had some of this purple wheat which we got our research institute in mohali the black wheat that's today being grown over acres and acres of farmers land but it's not just the farmer which is taking in this new technology we've connected it with many of these food products uh, groups who have actually taken that product and converted it into bakery products so you see the value chain from the technology to actually growing the wheat to making the product so these are early trends that we are seeing and i i could go on and on because we have so many models that have come in with interesting yeah, I aspects will, i will come back to you i will come back yeah. to you but i'm going to dive straight to sunil next because sunil you are in a startup here that is building I would love to hear from you what did two bioengineers what is the opportunity that they saw what is that the science that they were coming with and how what do they marrying together to address here so I'd love to sort of hear that part of the story if you could give us a glimpse of that sure thanks thanks ritu and um thank you um for giving us the opportunity to talk here uh, and present our uh, side of the story if i may um so uh and a good good evening to most of the folks here and good morning to kristin um 
Well, um, it, it, it started about uh, seven years back with uh, Ryan and Perumal, who are two um, uh, engineers. Uh, and they were working in two separate labs in two different parts of the US, um, working on the same problem, if I may. And um, they got uh, connected through a common friend and they soon found that they were asking the same question. And the question they asked is what makes milk milk? And why haven't plant-based alternatives been able to unlock the secret? Um, they soon discovered that uh, milk proteins, um, whey and casein possibly could be the secret. These complex proteins uh, or molecules uh, are perfectly structured to deliver dairy's unique flavor and texture uh, and taste. Um, we then um, started you know, working in a, small, a very small lab and they made recombinant uh, versions of these proteins. And they found that um, the proteins were able to, these proteins, especially the whey proteins, were able to significantly um, replicate the, the texture and flavor of milk. And there in started the, the journey. Um, well, uh, uh, it, uh, you know, for the founders to think that they have cracked or, or they have unlocked the secret and another thing for the consumer to actually say the same thing. So they, they went out and uh, they, they made a couple of products, ice cream and cream cheese were the first products that they made. And they found that it got sold out in, in record time. And that's when they realized that you know, they have something unique in their hands. And uh, over a period of time, the demand for this, this product they found uh, has been ubiquitous um, across geographies. And um, they, they soon found that um, you know, it, it's not uh, a, a palette specific. It seems to be um, you know, catering to the demands of multiple people So uh, across geographies. So therein started the, the journey. So, so this is a little bit of serendipity. Is that what I'm hearing? That, you know, I mean, I, I understand the academic problem, what makes milk milk or, you know, what makes something thing. But, uh, you know, is it a little bit of serendipity or, you know, were they trying to, you know, they kind of saw some trends and said, hey, look, we better understand milk here. I mean, um, just, just for the sake of our the entrepreneurs on this call, right? Uh, you know, a, a lot of people, as Dr. Sarup was alluding to, you know, are in science institutes, you know, you know, you're at a university, you are or at a research lab, and you know, you're working on problems and lots of things are academically interesting. But to commercialize the venture and to the scale that Perfect Day has gone on to, essentially, right? Um, you know, was it just serendipity that they discovered folks like this or was there more a little more to it? Well, uh, it's a combination of both, Ritu. So serendipity and being at the right place at the right time. So, so uh, one thing to note is, um, well, both of them are vegans. Um, majority company is vegan, uh, and they were bought into this concept of veganism, if I, if I may. Mm. And uh, so they, they were saw also that. bought into the concept. Yes, exactly. So regardless right. of you know, whether they struck gold at that point in time or not, they would have uh, you know, continued digging and continued plugging until they find this um, component. So, so they had a they had a pretty close up view of That's right. at least a set of consumers who were interested in something like this along with the scientific Absolutely. problem that they were looking to solve so awesome Absolutely. thank you for that sunil i'm, I'm going to just uh, you know flip to kirsten and you know i think dcdc needs no introduction kirsten i think you guys have one of the most cutting edge portfolios across the globe over here and i couldn't think of a better person to sort of ask than in in terms of you know uh, you guys have decided to invest in the agri and food space you have some pretty amazing from satellites to you know AI and robotics and all sorts of things in part of your portfolio here. Um, I'd love to kind of understand from you as an investor, as uh, you know, what what you guys sort of saw and see as sort of the intersections of sort of market trends as well as the science, because both of those have to come together for the creation of these kind of ventures here, and of course for you as an investor to invest in. Uh, uh, you know, to make that attractive. So we'd love to sort of hear your thoughts on that, Kirsten, over to you. Sure. Well, I, you know, I think in terms of deep technology, which is where we invest, um, it, and as you mentioned, we can bucket that both into biotechnologies, but also things that require, you know, deep expertise, long periods of time, and a long-term view on investments. Um, 
you know, that's sort of our bread and butter. And as you mentioned, it does take a different view, different structuring um, and different sort of um, infrastructure um, and, you know, everything from infrastructure to tax treatment to IP treatment in the, you know, the resident country or the geography in which the business wants to, to take place. So all of those factors become more important for us in terms of where we can invest and what kind of deep technology companies uh, we can build, right, to give some some contrast to some of the things that have been discussed by other panelists, um, you know, something that is a software based firm um, has a lot more flexibility in terms of geo you know, geography in which you can invest in companies like that because they're, it doesn't generally require IP protection, doesn't generally require um, a, a long term sort of stable societal scaffold or institutions in which that is sort of built on top of. And so all of those things become a little more important for us. And in terms of trends, right, Kirsten, is this, you know, why now? Like, is this, a, do you see this as an exciting time for a lot of these deep technology uh, companies to disrupt DAG and food? Or, you know, is it just that, you know, things have been coming along and there seem to be some interesting stuff happening? Or, or, or you know, I mean, I know I know you spoke about climate and resource limitations. Is, is that stuff, similar stuff that you guys see or something else here? I, I mean, you know, deep technologies, as I just described them, you know, we are always sort of pushing the envelope on in terms of what those are. And so I don't think there's any change in potential in in our opportunity to invest in deep technologies yeah. is something we've been doing for a really long time. Um, I think it changes over time. So whereas, uh, you know, six years ago, we were investing in, um, you know, uh, 3D printed rocket ships and, um, you know, as Anoush talked about, you know, p companies like Pivot Bio, um, and cell therapies and gene editing and things like that. Now we're looking at different types of technologies that are also on, you know, pushing the envelope in terms of what we consider deep tech and, and to provide, um, you know, a life changing society, society altering technologies on which we can all benefit. So, yeah, I think from scope, this is where we invest um, and take a long term view of these things. So, so these technologies are coming to maturity is sort of what I'm hearing you say. So the research on this has been happening forever, but they're reaching maturity to actually address markets and perhaps the potential has existed forever, but the reality of being able to do it is a different issue at the scale that commerce would require. Maybe that's something. I would say and, that and, too. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, so I just had one more question if I had to see. And, and, and I, I think, Kirsten, you have a global view here. So I would just also just love to kind of get your thoughts here. And, uh, you know, uh, do you see uh, geographically a lot of these emerging in certain places? And then do you see them scaling in other geographies? Uh, you know, or, or do you see the landscape for these deep technology companies to actually be global and how that they're, they're kind of sprouting? Well, I think the reality is that some geographies are created, you know, creators of deep technologies, and if we can use that term broadly, um, and some geographies are recipients, or and and then some, can, you know, have a really hard time receiving those technologies. So, you know, these types of endeavors require the proper incentives for people to build those companies, right? If you think about an individual who's perhaps in grad school and thinking about um, a PhD in plant biotechnology, if in that jurisdiction there is not long-term IP protection uh, over a long period of time and stable institutions on which to build on top of those institutions, then there's very little incentive uh, to proceed in that jurisdiction. So I think that's a major factor. Um, you know, India, for example, has had a history of, you know, sort of on the biotech side, certainly sort of more poor, weaker IP protection. Um, and a uh, you know, touch of price fixing and forced um, licensing in many spaces. And so that undermines people's ability to build companies and build technologies locally um, that suffer from the lack of that protection. Whereas you're seeing you know, software flourishing a little bit more because those things don't apply, right? So you, you can iterate, you can generate revenue early on. You don't, you're not look, doing R&D for a decade before you see a benefit from that and therefore you don't need as much, much protection. So that's why you're seeing those technologies proliferate in in India uh, specifically, um, so it's just about you know incentives and good institutions 
um, informed governance, right? All of these very basic things that allow deep tech, which takes a very um, um, you know, a little bit longer time frame. A in lot order more to effort. Yeah. 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 True, and I'm going to come back to you on that one because you know I think I would love for you to sort of unpack some of the journeys, and you know, as you very rightly said, software is a different beast compared to uh, you know how uh, how some of these companies behave, and you know yeah, what what you sort of think. I'll come back to you on that one. But uh, group and I kind of wanted to come to you, right? And I I think. Uh, you know, what I find very interesting of having you here is, you know, I, I, you've been deeply embedded in what I would call deep technology in ag uh, and as Advanta and as UPL. Uh, and what's even more interesting is the fact that you're kind of embedded in this globally. So you see an India view and you see a global view. On a macro level, are there trends that you see that are similar across the globe? Or are there some differences that you see in geographies and specifically if you could speak to India here, both in terms of what might be driving deeper innovations uh, or in the innovations that are actually happening? Uh, are there differences that you see? Yeah, thank you, Ritu, uh, for having me. Greetings to my panelists and the participant. Uh, I, I think the, <clears throat> the, the technology and innovation are global uh, by nature. And uh, from perspective of uh, agriculture and crop uh, improvement point of view, I think uh, there are three important factors. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat is not uh, uh, good today. So please bear with me, quality of my voice. Uh, there are three, uh, I, I call it uh, Triveni Sangam. There are three flow of rivers massively globally, uh, which are very relevant uh, to the event today. Number one, uh, the massive increase in uh, crop genome uh, knowledge uh, because of the capability of the data analysis. That there, is a, there is opening up uh, a tracer for the plant breeders. The speed is amazing. That is, that is a one important trend. Second, of course, very, very talked about and everyone knows about it, gene editing, right? Which is making, uh, you know, the precision uh, breeding, uh, you know, reducing the cycle of the breeding, etc. It's a powerful technology. Every breeder is, I mean, excited about this new technology coming in. And third, uh, which is very common across the sector, but more so in agriculture, is a, a capability to collect the data and analyze the data uh, with a massive speed. So these three area, if I really see that, you know, the three rivers merging, and that point of merger is, is, is a genesis of massive, you know, massive number of uh, startups. Uh, we see that happening. Uh, we are 60 years old uh, plant breeding company. And we realize that our, our breeders have mastered this game of plant breeding, but uh, we are, we also realize that uh, the new tech, the tools which are coming up in all the three areas, we need to really build the capabilities. Now we have two way of going it, to go going about it. One is you build up your own capabilities, which is a time consuming, especially in a plant which has a life cycle and biology. Second is uh, try try uh, and tie up with the relevant startups which are already in the game ahead of you. So I think that is something ha happening uh, in many countries uh, uh, in, in the world of Advanta. Let's say one example I give you in Australia, for example, there's a California based uh, company who is in a climate artificial intelligence. We have a massive database of last 30 years in a one crop, let's say sorghum canola in Australia. So we have data on the performance, on the agronomics, now on the weather uh, data coming up, but what do you do with the weather data other than the generic recommendation? Companies coming in, he's saying, you know, listen, Australian farmer is having 5,000 acre land. If, if we can geofence it, and we can really make that make the data which are usable for him and give the information on on time, which is a, which has a lot of value. To make it more precise, uh, Australian farmer want to plant a sorghum. Uh, ideal time, uh, you know, as per our agronomic uh, trials are, let's say, second week of uh, October, right? But there is a generic recommendation which has been going on for years together based on the massive technology, the TD technology development team data uh, happening, but the way, the way the patterns are changing dramatically. So when the recommendation came out that second week of October is an ideal planting window, but pers you know, but probably it's not so in, in year uh, 2021 or 2022, right? So, so based on that micro data information, they, they send information to the farmer, you know what, standard time is second week of October, but right now, the soil temperature is very, very low. Germination will be delayed. So better to wait for another 10 days time. So kind of idea, Got just it. giving you one idea. So, so yeah, that yeah, kind no, of, no. Uh, 
absolutely so so that kind of uh, you know the uh, innovations are coming up and this kind of example i can give you in more than half a dozen country which our teams are engaged with so so this is the area of uh, innovation and i think india uh, also is very open nowadays uh, very welcoming and uh, you know our teams are very excited about and initiating a couple of projects in the similar line so the needs you see as being fairly similar and you know countries maybe at different places of adoption with it but from a trend perspective sort of precision agriculture or you know precision uh, uh you know and the underlying uh, you know changes in computing and data and gene uh, editing driving that is something that you see across geographies here from the lens that you sort of see that here that is true okay. that is true okay thank you um you know so i'm going to switch gears a little bit right and i i kind of want to uh you know for uh, the audience you know in terms of both entrepreneurs as well uh as investors that might be on this call uh you know come back to something that uh, kirsten said this is not a digital startup in india we have a lot of digital startups so i think everybody's well versed in what those journeys are like um but I'd, I'd love to sort of kind of hear a bit more as to how you guys would describe some of these journeys. Uh, and, and, and Sunil, I'm going to come back to you. So I would just love to sort of, you know, have you talk a little bit about how, um, you know, we talked about the inception of the idea uh, and starting perfect day. Uh, I'm, any startup has its ups and downs. Uh, you know, is, is there a sort of a two minute snapshot of the journey. I know I'm asking for a lot, <laughs> but uh, is there sort of a two minute snapshot of the journey of a company like Perfect Day, which is, uh, you know, uh, the ups and downs of sort of actually building a large enterprise here uh, and, you know, taking something from a lab to the customer. Yes, and then I can't hear you. No. I'm sorry. So, uh, thanks. Uh, so, we started with a concept, Ritu, and uh, this concept was then you know, converted into a program. The first thing that we did was to build an incredible R&D team, small as it was at that point in time. It was um, made up of insanely motivated uh, folks, maybe about 10, 12 of them. And these folks, the ones who led the innovation at that point in time, um, this then led to the formation of, uh, of a product which enthused you know, investors to come in. So I think we've been uh, kind of lucky uh, to have the, the kind of partnership with in investors who not only saw potential for uh, a financial return, but also saw a huge potential in terms of social good or significant greenhouse gas reduction. So that I think was the main mission of the company, make food different, right? So the 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 taste remains the same, but uh, it's just making a different kind of a food. So that kind of um, accelerated, you know, the, the impact of our work. Uh, we have pivoted at multiple points uh, along the way, uh, especially to face the challenge of scaling. Uh, with given the significant demand of our products across the globe and especially in a in a pandemic situation it was extremely difficult uh, to manage a stressed global supply chain so uh, in short we uh, we kind of face problems with uh, strain engineering we face problems with uh, scaling up the process from lab all the way into 200000 liter fermenters uh, we face problems transferring the technology to uh, to our different CMOs, um, which were in different countries, which had fermenters of a totally different design. So we needed to do what's known as a scale down model. So normally in fermentation, what we do is a scale up model. But in this case, we had to go and visit the CMOs, figure out what designs of fermenters they had, and then come back to the drawing board, design small scale fermenters, which would mimic what happens there. So those were done at, at very rapid pace, given that the investors had the confidence and they were willing to put in money. But uh, in short, I would say the, the team uh, and having the team at the right place at the right time mattered the most. And having the right investors who played along with us, that also mattered. 
So Sunil, uh, I, yeah, I, I, it's good to have investors that are kind of supporting you through this journey. I, I'll, I'll vouch for that one. Uh, but uh, is there, is there uh, like from Perfect's day perspective, right? And if you were to be sort of advising about a company here who's sort of just thinking about starting up, you know, uh, is there some kind of like milestones that you guys had in mind along the way? Um, you know, you mentioned some challenges that you faced here. Uh, would it would it be helpful for uh, you know uh, entrepreneurs to be thinking of like, look, I have to get from this scale to that scale, or I have to sort out this particular part? You know, how is there something more you could tell us about that? I, I would think, uh, yeah, any entrepreneur or any budding entrepreneur would need to show proof of concept. So uh, that I think is. Uh, is the way to go get to the proof of concept at the earliest and show, show the, that it's the path that you took is a sustainable one uh, i think these are the two most critical uh, parameters uh, there's, there's, if you have a team that can uh, demonstrate these two i think you're pretty much you're pretty much done the the final the the proof of the pudding is in the product that you finally show to the investors and to the world so if that is done and if as i mentioned before if it is sustainable i think you're good to go okay so now i might come back to you because kirsten i'm going to turn to you because obviously there's not one journey there are many journeys that you are kind of uh privy to here right um if i was a digital startup the proof of the product you know could be two days of work 10 days of work creating some app or some nice thing over here right obviously that's not how and sunil says you have to create a product at the end here so 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 tell us more about how what you have seen what you find you know what's uh, what's the point at which you find some of these things interesting so if there are entrepreneurs on the other side, um, you know, uh, how should they be thinking about navigating this journey? Sure, I, I'll try to illustrate, you know, uh, two different types of journeys as you're calling them, uh, you know, both on the biotechnology side and then perhaps on the robotics and automation side. Mm, yeah, so it's true. pretty That's it's, so true. Yeah, because they're, they're different um, types of journeys. You know, it's pretty typical for us to we invest in early stage uh, companies, so either Series A or we'll put something companies together. And so it's not atypical for us to either we find an interesting technology in a university or a specific uh, you know postdoctoral fellow or someone wants to come out and spin out that technology or or academic professor. So then we'll license that from the university. So that's step number one. That process has to be easy and frictionless. Um, uh, that's really important. The more difficult that is, that you know, we know that the less chance uh, technology has of seeing the light of day. And then we'll design a series of experiments to prove out that technology to make sure that it is reproducible in everyone's hands outside of the original setting. And the team becomes very important. We want to make sure the team is coming together. It's first in class, um, and those individuals have truly earned uh, an earned insight in that space and an ability to execute um, in that space. And then we, we build from there. So we'll build a series of milestones and make sure that we're funding to those milestones because the journey can be long, especially in the context of biotechnology, if you're going to build a regulated product, right? If you have to go through any sort of regulatory process now with the advent of genome editing, that is becoming a lot faster and easier, which is going to create a lot of innovation uh, as, a, as opposed to um, more regulated products, which sort of stifles innovation to a large degree. So that would be one type of area that, um, you know, we're very invested in and or interested in. And of course, as we mentioned before, that's where we're looking for geographies in which that can happen. Um, and so that would be companies like Pivot Bio. We have another company um, in the um, industrial biotechnology space, BioFaro, that is making um, um, insect pheromones uh, through a proprietary method. And then on the flip side, uh, we have companies like Sabanto Ag and Verdant Robotics that are uh, completely automating agriculture. And so Sabanto Ag, for example, um, can conduct all farm operations um, on fields running from their office in Chicago. Um, so they're completely autonomous and can oh. conduct everything right there because they wanted to help farmers with this issue of labor and labor shortage. Now, of course, 
that sort of technology also takes a long time to develop, but you can iterate a little bit, but also has to exist on top of really good institutions, land ownership, um, you, you know, allow farmers the ability to aggregate land and grow and, 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 and shrink and is really challenging in a smallholder setting. And so here again, even though you might think, oh, it's digital, it's robotics and automation, it's engineering, these are expensive long-term type of technology and sort of also need that infrastructure support. So those would be sort of two examples of, of different ends of the spectrum of, of where we invest in and what we sort of look for. But most important, you know, team and technology are probably equally important. So are you saying that the IP protection, when you say technology and you said, you know, the, the team is sort of the owner of this entire piece here, that, uh, you know, IP becomes a pretty critical piece for you? In, in Absolutely. Sort of here and saying that this is the moat and if this is going to be a long journey, I want to know I own this at the end of the day. And that's an yes. important piece. Whether that's it's right. I'm a robotics company or a biotech company here. That's right, because these journeys are long, expensive, um, and you know we want them to be transformational, the teams need that incentive that at the end of the day, what they've built will be protected and that they'll, they'll be rewarded uh, for what they've built. Mm -hmm. It's sort of inherent to human nature. And so in both cases, IP protection is paramount for wherever you're looking to build those technologies. Got it, got it. Um... Uh, Dr. Swarup, if I may ask you to come in a little bit here, uh, you know, I, I would love, I know you've seen a lot of pharma companies happen in India and those journeys. Um, any, any, any learnings that entrepreneurs can take away in the agri and food domain from the pharma healthcare vertical uh, that, that translate well here? Or, uh, you know, do you think that this is a very different kind of journey for a, for a biotech startup? Uh, Ritu, I think a journey for a biotech startup is the same whether it's pharma based or whether it's agri based. It's only where the demand is and where the markets are which are different. Yes, there's a lot of learning that can be taken forward, but I think what is important is that the key components of the ecosystem remain the same. You've just heard the panelists speak about some very key technologies and you've also heard from the investor viewpoint. And yes, I totally agree it's the team and the technology which matters. How do you connect them? So I think what is key is right now, whether it's the agri sector, whether it's the pharma sector, is how do you make those right connections of the technology being robust, moving out of technology institutes to startups and really converting an excellent technology into something which is can really then become an enterprise and which can become a product which as Sunil said, is something which the consumer accepts. But that's the entire value chain which has to be looked at. And in India, we have had this experience through this whole biotech journey that we've done. And it's not only for pharma, we've done it across all sectors, including agri, where we've, in fact, IP, a very important point raised. I think our first and foremost principle of supporting startups from the government was that the IP stays with the startup. I mean, that was a major decision that the government that, yeah. we, become, we become early investors into it to, to mitigate their risk, to mitigate the risk of the investors because we're doing technical due diligence, but there was no right on the IP that the government kept. Only for this reason, what the investor has just said, that they wanted a free IP where then the investors could come in. But I think it is also important that in addition to uh, seeing how there is a demand for the product, that is going to be key and critical because you need to have markets which will drive the startups because it has to and that's so really what happened in the market. yeah so dr sort of just if i you know if i come back if i'm a drug discovery company my pathway to commercialization you know i need to get through phase one trials phase two trials phase three trials right if i'm an ag input company right it's a little less clear right, as to sort of how that journey progresses, right? I, I agree with you that at the end, the market has to sort of kind of happen here, right? So is there, a, you know, but are there parallels that you see in something like this uh, coming out in the ag and food ecosystem? That That is just much clearer to me as a researcher or an entrepreneur in here saying that, look, you know, here are milestones that I have hit 
that you know i'm de-risking this as i go along or is it more so, you know it's different here so i think <clears throat> i think ritu it's very clear that every product that you look at and every technology has its own pathway <clears throat> if you are looking at gene editing products if you are looking at genomic space product <clears throat> excuse me or if you are looking at a product which is you just spoke about i mean you're looking at what uh, sunil said a fermentation based product obviously the regulatory pathways for each one of them is different but it's very clearly mm -hmm. spelled out what the regulatory pathway and the same is in the pharma sector if you look at a medical device which has come out i mean that's yeah. that's a different path that we follow from what really would be in terms of a new drug which is developed or a new vaccine or in terms of uh, cell therapies and gene therapies which would be totally a different process so the pathways are clear <clears throat> i think what is important is how do you plan your whole journey where are those milestones that you put in and for this today we are at a point where in india especially since we are talking about india the government has come forward with its you know said okay we are partners with you till it actually gets into a stage where investors are ready to come in but it's important for each product then to identify what is that point whether it's the proof of concept is what's said or you go into early validations which gives the investor a level of confidence Comfort. for early stage and and in many of these as you've seen we've also become investors we've actually gone yeah. in and said from the government we we become partners with you in a fund of funds so we've gone one step ahead so i think each one of them has to be looked at differently but yes the path is clear the path is clear bhupen i'm going to come to you when are you comfortable partnering you said you know that for advanta there is a lot of benefit in sort of working with uh you know entrepreneurs in the deep technologies just because time to market or you know whatever reinventing the wheel is not something that you guys are interested in but when is the right time you know and dr swarup also talked about you know partnerships with corporates etc for a lot of technologies to make it out in the market how does it want to view what is a good time and what is a to partner <clears throat> very very i was listening very uh, attentively to dr swarup indicated i think the recent visit to uh, indian institute of military research hyderabad uh, was very eye opening for me what is happening uh, in the front of government policy enabling there i met the director he took me to a nutri hub adjoining campus nearby and i met the ceo of that it's like a government institute is just i mean uh, i was really amazed to see when i interacted with him he said you know what which hotel are you staying in i said i am staying in so and so hotel <clears throat> he said have you seen the menu i said not i'm not very foody type so i have not really paid too much of attention he said early morning early why everybody should take corn flakes only right why why not to have a corn flakes on monday uh, the millet flakes on tuesday sorghum you know flakes and ragi flakes likewise okay how do we go about it then he took me to his around you know visit of his entire campus and what he was doing was amazing there i'm talking about government institute so they have more than 200 entrepreneurs all coming from surrounding areas young uh, youngsters from the college a lot of ideas enthusiasm so one gentleman was uh, by the, the, he conceptualized the uh, the sorghum uh, corn flag now for that machines required are totally different it's eco ecosystem development right so there is a machine company provider in coimbatore they provided a space there they came with the corn flag machine and they okay how do we adapt to the sorghum flag how do we make it because corn is a big size grain and sorghum is a smaller than that so they designed that machine for that and started doing a trial there and they came out of the sorghum flags then they come out of the sorghum biscuits gluten free and the marketing team coming in and the amount is quite big in the entire campus i think about 20 crore rupees or so and i was amazed and i say okay how do we connect with advanta my team because our teams are basically crop focused how do we improve our crop and add the trait that is what our specialty is i said okay fine so what are the trait you are looking for what in sorghum then the the food engineer who was there he said we are looking for this kind of parameters in sorghum which we are missing right now now advanta has a, one of the biggest sorghum germplasm in the world we have for uh, so germplasm for the biofuel uh, for the sweet uh, you know sweet sorghum for the jaggery etc for the grain for the beer etc etc a variety of segment i connected him with our breeder there and now they are working on the project as i speaks with you and then i give example similar experience i had in in, uh, in kenya uh, the brewery uh, one of the event i went there the owner of the brewery says 
we are making a beer out of a sorghum, but our productivity is very, very low. This is about three years ago. Yes. And they, both the team met there. They, 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 they gave the wish list to our breeders and they developed the plant, which already we had it in L4, L4, L5. They advanced it. We have two varieties registered in Kenya now only for beer, uh, uh, you know, sugar beer. And we have now developed a business model whereby he buys uh, so sorghum seed from Advanta fully, give it to the farmers, and he buys back. For the first time, this model has come in Kenya. Likewise, we are conceptualizing in uh, in, in Hyderabad with the sorghum for the biscuits, etc. Two examples. So, so, so amazing things are happening in, in, the, in these areas. And entrepreneurs which are coming in with a totally different mindset. Of course, another thing which I observed while interviewing some of the entrepreneurs there was earlier days in a, when a, you know students are coming out of the college looking for a job, you know, and then that is how the one path is. But now I think being a part of the business uh, in the in a small town also, and being a businessman has a lot of uh, status, a lot of reputation going in. A lot of financial companies are coming in supporting them. All ecosystem, the way is evolving. And I realize that I'm so far away from the reality. Uh, what is happening in Hyderabad, I'm sure <laughs> this is happening in many part of the city around the, uh, around the country. So it's like a- But uh, Bhupin, so no Bhupin, if I may in, interrupt, right? What doesn't work, right? So I'm just trying, I'm trying to unpack this a little bit for uh, the entrepreneur, right? So let's say I'm, you know, I mean, I don't know, I'm making flakes or whatever. I mean, how, what, what wouldn't work for Advanta? And can I be too early, you know, uh, to have to have, uh, you know, I mean, how do I know what strategically Advanta wants to do versus what I'm doing? How, how does, uh, you know, how does one land at, a, a corporate yes. to sort of have a partnership and what are the some things that just don't work right i mean where i may be too immature for advanta to deal with me right in terms of where i am with my venture or my product or something like that right or i uh, so so the, i we'd love to sort of hear what doesn't work also I think very, very valid point because the corporate structure, its own, and especially mm. listed entity has own set processes. So how yeah. do we evolve this partnership uh, with a startup? Very, very important point. I think uh, the, the, the way it, it is working in Advanta is, number one, Advanta is, is a very broad portfolio of crop which we have. We are not very narrowed one, only on the corn or soybean or a couple of more crop. Uh, we, we have more than 50 crops around the world. So that is a first enabling factor. So we can collaborate with many entrepreneurs in this area, number one. Number two, breeders, plant breeders, typically, uh, let's say if I talk about Asia or India, they, so, you know, because the cycle is for eight to 10 years to bring a product to the market in, in new variety, it takes about eight to 10 years. So it's a long gestation period. And therefore the breeder, breeding community takes the breeding target when we have a budgeting session next month, we will have a breeding target for key crop. Earlier days, breeding target used to be agronomic in nature. You know, yield going up or resistance to a particular disease or, or tolerant to a, to a drought, etc. Or, or color of okra instead of a green, can, can we have a red? There's a market value. So based on the market value, perception and understanding, breeder will come out a list of the trade they want. Now, uh, what, because one of, one of the philosophy we are now uh, in our group we are operating is that it's not that we are expert, we are expert in one field. So let's have a philosophy called, uh, you know, the orientation called open end. How do we collaborate? So each right. team leader in, in R&D is encouraged to say how many open collaboration he has set up with. Be it a public sector, private sector, startup, that is something we have revised our metrics. How many collaboration he has entered into. And that is where it is really helping us a lot. So, so that breeding targets are undergoing a tremendous change. The list which is coming in front of us for the for the funding right. of the uh, different research project is, is changing dramatically in the last two years' time. Awesome. Good to hear that, right? I don't think I see that everywhere. For example, so, just to like, 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 was coming to my mind, uh, the yeah. Sunil. Sunil is developing a milk out of a plant. So the question was coming to my mind that me and Sunil must have a separate discussion what trade in which plant you want us, uh, you know, let, 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 let's make your, your team and my team, they work together and develop the, your, your desired trait in a given plant, in a given geography, you want, we can, we can come out of the uh, research project out of it. 
So I went super remiss on time and I just saw what the clock is. So I'm a super upset at what time it is on the clock. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a very quick round the room because I do kind of want to like, uh, you know, get to this, uh, you know, some of your thoughts in India. So Sunil, this is going to be rapid fire, right? You guys have come to India to set up a plant. You told me your R&D facility is set up in India. You're based in San Francisco. Um, what did you see? What do you think are the opportunities? And you know, uh, what what are some of the uh, some of the opportunities that folks here could kind of tap into? So uh, very very rapidly because that clock is moving on me. <laughs> sure. Um, thanks, Ritu. Very quickly, uh, in addition to the you know the the um, run of the mill uh, stories of lower capex and lower uh, you know raw material cost. What we are looking for, and Perfect Day is oriented, are wired a bit differently. We're looking for collaborators. We're looking for folks who can bring in new technologies. Uh, and we're looking for you know, innovation. So that's the whole purpose of setting up the R&D lab in India. Be it uh, any product which meets the, the, the mission or which falls within the mission and vision, which is to bring to the customers high quality products with least impact on say the carbon footprint uh, i would be very happy and i'm glad that um you know, dr dubey uh, told me uh, he's open to uh, uh, collaboration so this is the kind of interaction that we are looking for uh, innovation at its uh, highest level so that's that's more like what perfect day is um, looking for in india but since you made the decision to do this in india what drove that decision one word um, multiple factors. So, uh, one, the current ecosystem in India, possibly the best biotech ecosystem in the world. Uh, two, I think the single window clearance, which has been put in force, uh, kind of, we kind of got uh, regulatory approvals um, much faster than what we thought we would. So that uh, a lot seem a lot needs to be done on regulatory approvals for uh, you know, the alternate right. food proteins right. from uh, modified organisms. But that's a process which is ongoing. And that would bring a change in mindset of people, but from the government and from um, the support that we got from uh, regulatory folks, it's been awesome. So much faster than okay. what we thought. Awesome. Thanks for that, Sunil. So I'm sorry I'm rushing you, but I just sort of have to do that. Kirsten, I mean, do you think that there is any differences for biotech companies, uh, you know, based out of India versus what you might see in the Valley, right? Is there, is there, are there opportunities that you think that uh, a company out of India could target perhaps more effectively than something from the Valley? Yeah, I mean, there's, um, you know, you know, a lot of, some of our companies use resources in India, especially around chemistry, et cetera, where there's really good expertise uh, and good mm -hmm. universities um, and training mm -hmm. uh, in the space. And I think, you know, some companies are just savvy about where they keep their IP versus where they keep certain expertise. And I think that model has worked uh, fairly well for companies where that's relevant. Yep. Got it. Thanks. And, 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 uh, and Bhupen, from your side, right? Um, any, any, uh, you know, any thoughts here on sort of India as a, as a, uh, you know, biotech entrepreneurs from India targeting either India or global opportunities? Are there any, any specific strengths that you have seen, uh, you know, crossing since you're crossing all sorts of global opportunities here? I think uh, I endorse uh, because what Sunil is indicating, our experience is uh, wonderful. Uh, India in our space is a land of opportunity uh, among top three uh, fast growing businesses in the world of Advanta. We operate in 80 countries. India is one of top three. Uh, so that is a wonderful uh, things happening there. Uh, and I you know the, the race has just begun. India is self-sufficient in most of the areas. Uh, the, the government is setting a target for the exports, etc. I think we can do wonders. I mean, simple, broad uh, uh, indicator is China has a much less uh, arable land in India, uh, you know, India is 190 million hectare plus, China is 130 million hectare plus. Uh, size of the land holding is similar or China is even smaller. But the output, GDP output from agriculture is $1 trillion. India is around 380 to 400 yeah. million dollars. Yeah. One India can't be a trillion dollars. To my mind, so you're saying no that's low pay. 
absolutely absolutely so the journey has just begun we can we can accelerate uh, but you know just to uh, to what sunil indicated uh, one recommendation is i think what i'm looking forward to is because last mile we are all commercial organization and we have investors who are putting money in in organization they are looking at the timeline so last mile certainty in commercializing or going to the market if this is area is government become more sensitive uh, and that will accelerate the speed further well, got you bhopesh and well well you know we could go on for that but i'm again cognizant of the clock so sorry to cut you off dr swarup i'm going to leave the last word for you if you had to pick one word to sort of uh as an inspiration for entrepreneurs to take the plunge and you know take up the opportunities uh both in india and globally what would that be so ritu first of all it's so satisfying to hear our industry and entrepreneurs on your panel here and i'm sure they're uh, reflecting the sentiments of all to say that that's we've already begun the race as he said and this is really where we are so i think one word to them is the inflection point is now if you really need to make you know get into this business that's the time we've made the initial steps we've made the ecosystem ready i think everyone has to come forward to make the best of it and if you do we've already projected for india 150 billion dollar industry of biotech by 2025 and 100 billion bio manufacturing hub i'm sure we can prove these as underestimated targets and we can do much better so my only point also, to them is set the target 150 billion okay so that's where we need to get to in the next what uh, four years yeah so i I'm, i'm going to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists uh, especially the panelists that woke up at some really crazy hours to join us from the west coast so thank you very much for sort of doing that i think we've heard um, a lot about sort of different kinds of trends that are kind of happening globally but i think more importantly for the entrepreneurs and investors and other ecosystem players on this uh, uh in the audience here we are sitting on a very large opportunity we have a target of 150 billion you heard dr swarup say that um you know we there is technical talent that is available the regulatory frameworks have cleared and perhaps there's more to do but at least the pathway has sort of started uh now what we need are the actual companies here uh that are uh you know running this path gauntlet here so uh, i for one i'm super excited and can't wait to see many more of these happen out of india um and i want to just thank everyone for being here and for a very exciting discussion so look forward to seeing this happen a huge thank you to all our speakers this evening for that truly insightful and inspiring discussion It's exciting to hear that the talent and skill set is already present in India and that with the right support resources and regulatory frameworks behind them we could see a significant acceleration towards this next innovation frontier we hope all of you who tuned in for this live discussion enjoyed it as much as we did and have been inspired that's a wrap for today and thanks to everyone for joining us for what has been a packed program of content and networking tomorrow We'll be back at 9 a.m. Singapore time for early networking and a workshop hosted by ADB on green financing and natural capital investment models. See you then.